fill them out of the 1960 through 2012. Philip Little passed away at Carolina's Hospital in Florence, South Carolina, Tuesday, October 9, 2012, after an extended illness. Born July 27, 1960, in Anderson, South Carolina, he was the son of James Oscar Little and the late Julia Rushville. Mr. Little graduated from West Florence High School, Florence, South Carolina, in 1978. He was married to Dana Wallace Little for 29 years. He was a loyal employee at ABB in Florence for 32 years. The Little family, Oscar and Julia and their three boys, moved multiple times over the years, ending up in 1976 in the Florence area. Prior to that, the family had lived in Moultrie, Georgia from 1972 to 1976, in Durham, North Carolina from 1968 through 1972, in Cookville, Tennessee from 1966 through 1968, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina from 1960 to 1966, and at Phillipsburg, the family lived in Abbeville, South Carolina in 1960. Although Philip was born in the nearby Anderson County Hospital in Anderson, South Carolina, the hometown of both of his parents. Philip loved life and lived it to the full. He was a horror man. He enjoyed hunting, fishing, football, grilling, and frying turkeys. He grew up during, a, during an impressionable part of his life in Southwest Georgia, and while there became a devoted, lifelong Georgia Bulldog fan. He also favored the Dallas Cowboys of the NFL. He enjoyed gardening, particularly raising tomatoes. Philip appreciated nature and could often be found riding around the property on his four-wheel UTV, taking in the fresh air. Philip will be missed by all who knew him. He leaves behind his wife, Dana, his father, James Oscar Little, two brothers, Ned and Greg Little, all of Darlington. Also nieces, Rebecca Little Brock of Hartsville, Lindsay Little Glass of Moultrie, Georgia, Taylor Stackley of Effingham, and Brooke Solomon of Darlington. Nephews, Tony Little of Hartsville, James Little, and Blake Solomon, both of Darlington. The Little family wishes to convey their deepest appreciation to nursing staff at the, at the Carolinas Hospital System and the Regency Hospital, as well as certain doctors involved in Phil's treatment and care. Of course, most of you know that Phil was my brother, and this has been a very difficult time for our family, and it's, it's not easy now, and, and I couldn't read the obituary set, so that's why I had my son do it. But, uh, you know, Philip, there's some things that can be said about him. Many things have already been said, and many more could be said. Uh, but, you know, one thing I hope someone will one day say about me is he was a genuine person. And when he told you something, you could count on and, and, you know, what more can you ask of somebody? When we see all the friends he has and the support that he had, even all that time in the hospital, it really shows that, that uh, he was a unique person. Uh, something that some know, and many may not, is that Philip was actually raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, when the, our mother was a Jehovah's Witness, and she raised us boys, and uh, I even remember him going door to door, offering to watch down the way. Uh, at one time, he had uh, short talks, five-minute Bible talks, and he gave in front of the congregation. So as a young person, he was active in that. And of course, as he got older, he, he really didn't embrace it. He never was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, meaning being baptized as one. But I know uh, much about what Philip believed. We had had many discussions just a week or so before he died. We actually talked about some of these things because he, he knew he was dying. And so I, I know his thoughts, and, and I want to share some of those with you And uh, because really these things come from the Bible. And the Bible has to be the source of comfort that we depend on. We can't go by what you know, certain individuals say or even what certain religions say because, you know, the body of Christianity as we know it today consists of many religions. And they teach many different things. And a lot of those things, uh, with good motives, have come about just to be a comfort to the breed, but not necessarily firmly rooted in the Bible. Uh, you know, um, you'll hear people say that when someone dies, they go to heaven or hell. That's one of the predominant beliefs. Uh, there are many other thoughts, too, that people may be in a place called limbo or purgatory. And these are words and concepts that are not even found in the Bible. 
And so where can we go for real answers? Well, of course, again, I want to say the Bible. And I'm going to share a few scriptures with you this morning. Uh, first of all, a question that all of us would want to know uh, the answer to. And that is why people grow old or either get sick and die. You know, when in Philip's situation here, of course, it's been very painful for the family. But when you think about that, when something like that hits you, sometimes you also think about this is just one of billions that have gone before him. Think of all the suffering and the agony that families and friends down through history went through when they lose loved ones, and some even in much more difficult cases that are experiences than what we had. So how painful that is. And do you wonder, did the God of heaven, the God of love, mean for humans to have to undergo such things? Now, what do you think about that? Well, let's, let's just start with answering the question, why man gets sick or grows old and dies? Romans 5, 12. Is, uh, is a book of the Bible that uh, has a number of good answers to this kind of question. But uh, Apostle Paul wrote this under inspiration from God. And he says this in uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. He says, That is why, just as through one man, that was Adam, of course, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because they had all sinned. So see, all of us inherited sin, unfortunately, from our forefather Adam. And so the best that we can hope for in this whole system is to grow, eventually grow old and die. And many other things can happen along the way, can't it? So uh, again, uh, Adam was the cause of this. Uh, today, uh, you and I can't help being sinful. We can do the very best we can try to do, and we still can't measure up perfectly, whereas Adam could have. So God held him accountable. You think about that account back in Genesis. He had told Adam that if he sinned, if he, if he went to that tree that was in the middle of the garden, that he would die. That tree represented God's sovereignty, his right to make the rules for mankind. Adam disobeyed deliberately doing so when he had the ability within him to have perfect obedience. He didn't do that. And so therefore, it brought upon man what we see here today before us. Well, what happens to a person when they die? Well, again, depending on who you talk to or what religion you might be part of, and even outside of Christianity, other religions have all sorts of thinking and thought processes about what happens when a person dies. But you know, again, what does the Bible say? Let's look at a couple of scriptures uh, uh, along these lines. The first one is in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, some may know that uh, wise King Solomon wrote this book of the Bible under inspiration from God. And he says a couple of simple points here, which I'm actually going to use another scripture after this to support this, but he says here something that may be strange to your ears. He says, for the living are conscious that they will die, but as for the dead, they are conscious of nothing at all. And in verse 6 he says, also, their love and their hate and their jealousy have already perished. The indicator here is, of course, when a person goes to sleep and death, they're unconscious. Uh, a good illustration that I once heard is that it's like when you're at home and you're watching your television, maybe watching a two-hour movie. Halfway through that movie, you go to sleep. When you wake up and it's over, all sorts of things that happen right there in the room in front of you that you have no awareness. You did not know. You don't know how it's going to be in Well, death is, is compared, compared to sleep. In fact, I want to show you where Jesus himself did that very thing. This is in the book of John chapter 11. And you know, uh, this book, this chapter of the Bible, John 11, is a chapter that deals with the resurrection of Lazarus. And most of us who are uh, profess to be Christians are, are well familiar with what happened here. The ultimate outcome was Lazarus was resurrected then and there. But that was not known by anybody ahead of time except Jesus himself. And we'll see that as we look at a couple of things here in, in John 11. Here, Jesus says something to his, apostles, his disciples that are along with him. They're, they're several days away from the little town of Bethany where Lazarus and Martha and Mary live. And he's headed back because he'd gotten word that Lazarus was sick, and Jesus had actually perceived miraculously that he was dead. Now, in verse 11 of John 11, it says, uh, Jesus is talking, he says, Lazarus, our friend, has gone to rest, but I am journeying there to awaken him from sleep. 
Then, therefore, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has gone to rest, he will get well. Jesus had spoken, however, about his death, but they imagined that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. At that time, therefore, Jesus said to them, outspokenly, Lazarus has died. So you see the thought there? Jesus makes this comparison to sleep. And in that particular case, it really was like a literal sleep because Jesus could go there and wake him up. And you know, Lazarus had been dead about four days by the time Jesus got there. The Jews had, of course, to this day, they have the practice of immediately burying their dead because they don't do anything other than watch the body. And the body, after four days, no doubt, had sort of suffered serious decay. But in the account, we see that Jesus, uh, Lazarus came out whole. He, he was in, in good shape when Jesus resurrected him after such a time. So what a nice thought that is to give us uh, insight into the capability that Christ, and of course his Father, Almighty God, has to bring the dead back to life. So, you know, we're talking here, though, about when a person dies, they're unconscious. Well, if that was it, that's pretty bleak, isn't it? Is that the end of the person? Well, that's not what the Bible says at all. There certainly is a great hope for ones we've lost in death. All of our loved ones that we've been through these things before, most of us, uh, we, uh, we think about them from time to time. We'd like to see them, talk to them. Well... The Bible has a hope for that. Let's look at uh, the book of Job. And, uh, you know, I have just chosen selected scriptures today uh, because we don't have time to look at all of what the Bible has to say about death and, and so forth. But I chose this particular scripture because this is one of the oldest books of the Bible. So we're going back into antiquity and looking what, at what the very early servants of God, such as Job, believed about death and dying. Job chapter 14, verse 14. And if you remember the case of Job, Job had been very sick to the point of death, even to the point that he asked God to let him die. That's how bad off this man had been. So he'd been through a lot. But now in Job chapter 14, verse 14, we see why Job asked for death. Because he says this. He says, if an able-bodied man dies, can he live again? All the days of my compulsory service, his time in the grave, I shall wait until my relief comes. You will call, I myself shall answer you. For the work of your hand, you will have a yearning. Um, uh, some of the poems that were passed out, the poem on the back is based on these verses. That God has a yearning for the works of his hands. You know... No doubt most of us, hopefully even all of us, accept that there was creation, that God created the earth, made it ready for man, and then put us here. But what did he have in mind? Did he mean for us to just you know, grow old and die? Was that the case from the beginning? So certainly not. Um, and when he made mankind, though, on the earth, that is, that was his crowning achievement. You know, the Bible says that we're made in God's image. We have feelings like God does. He made us to be able to think ahead, to plan for the future, to determine whether we will serve God or not. Those are all things that we have options on. You know, you compare it to any other life form on earth, nothing else has those abilities. And of course, there are many other things that set us apart from animals as well. So God, it says, has a yearning for the work of his hands. All of us are crowning achievements of creation. And he loves every individual, and he wants to see us serve him, do what's right. He wants to remember us, and one day bring us back if we die. Now, going to John chapter 11 again. Now, to me, uh, John 11 is one of the most important areas of the Bible talking about this very subject, because one of the reasons is this is Jesus. You know, this is Jesus' feelings and his thoughts and his talking about the condition of the dead and their hope. Now, again, here, we're going to pick up with a conversation between Lazarus' sister Martha and Jesus after Lazarus had died. Uh, she says in verse 21, now, and one thing I want to mention is earlier in the book of John, Jesus is shown being in their home teaching them things, many things. And he was intimate friends with, with his family. So much so that later, just before he resurrected Lazarus, it says he gave way to tears. He cried. These people were close to him, and, and, he, and he hurt for them. Now, 
In the conversation between Martha and Jesus in verse 21, it says, Martha therefore said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, it was well known that Jesus had the ability to do miracles, to even raise the, uh, raise the dead later on. But in this case, what she must have been thinking about was he had the ability to heal her brother, but she must not have been aware that he could bring him back to life in and there. And so in verse 23, Jesus replies to her, he says, your brother will rise. Now listen to what Martha says back to him. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Martha looked forward to sometime in the future there being a resurrection where she could see her brother again. She didn't know what was about to happen then and there, did she? But she looked forward to the time when there would be a resurrection. And you know, this word resurrection is mentioned repeatedly throughout the Bible. This, this is a uh, fundamental teaching of uh, Christ and the apostles that there's going to be a resurrection. So, with that in mind, uh, of course, Jesus proceeded to resurrect Lazarus, and, and they were all overcome with joy at that time. Uh, what a happy occasion that had to have been to see that person come back to life, their loved one. Well, again, the Bible speaks of a time when we can experience that ourselves. If, if we're here when the resurrection occurs, at some point in time, God's going to run it into the system. And then after that, there'll be a resurrection of the dead. And we can, we can see that happen if we're privileged to live to that point in time. Now, something that I want to share with you is when a person's resurrected, where are they going to be resurrected to? It would be terrible to be resurrected back to this little corrupt world here with it and have to go through these kinds of things again. You know, when Lazarus was resurrected, he eventually had to die again. But is that going to be the case with this future resurrection? Revelation 21, 3 and 4, uh, here we see something painted for us in vision about the future hope of mankind on this earth. In verse 3 it says, With that I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look, the tent of God is with mankind, and he will reside with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. Now, this is at the very end of the Bible. There's only a few more sentences after this. This is the culmination for man. God's going to be with him. And it says the tent of God is going to be over man. You know, a tent represents protection from, from elements, from rain, from wind, from sun, whatever. So, in the beginning, Adam had that tent, that protection. Adam, had he been obedient, would still be here today. One day, mankind's going to be restored to the condition Adam had. And they'll have that tent back. Now, what will be the result? Well, verse 4 says, and he will wipe out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither will mourning nor outcry nor pain be any more. The former things have passed away. So right from the Bible, friends, that we see that there is a real hope for the future, even for ones who have left us in death. As sad as it is, we can see that the Bible gives us hope and conquer. Well, you know, some have had concern for the hope that's been expressed to me because he was not a religious person. He didn't go to church. And many have had concern about that, and some have actually expressed it. So what is the hope for him? Some might think it's not, not to be good. Let me share with you a, a simple scripture in the book of, back in the book of Romans, chapter 6. You remember I read earlier in Romans 5, 12, uh, um, Paul was talking about sin bringing on death. Well, here, just a chapter later, he says something specific about that. In, in Romans 6, verse 7, the wording is, For he who has died has been acquitted from, from his sins. You know what it means to be acquitted? You go to court today tried for something, and you're acquitted, they can never try you for that again. You're a slave for that particular incident is wiped clean. Well, in God's sight, when an individual dies, he's paid the penalty. Think about it. What did he tell Adam? If you did this thing, you will die. Sin had entered into the world, and death through sin. So death is a penalty for sin that all of us must pay eventually in this whole system. Verse 23 gives us the hope, though. 
It says, for the wages, sin pays is death. See, there's again the same sort of thought. But the gift God gives is everlasting life by Christ Jesus our Lord. So yes, friends, the uh, opportunity to live again will be there for Philip. And uh, hopefully we can be there to welcome him back. What, what a heartwarming thought that is. And it's, it's comfort that again comes directly from the Bible. Now, I just want to share a couple other scriptures in Acts chapter 24. Here, we're looking at an account where the Apostle Paul was defending essentially Christianity before the Roman governor, Felix. You know, the Romans were really hard down on the Christians back at this time. And he was making a defense, and he did a wonderful job actually having this governor at the end, uh, you know, almost saying, I don't want to become one of you. Well, the Christians were not well alive back in the first century, that's for sure. So he was giving this defense, and he gave a number of things, but in verse 15, here's what Paul says. And he had a number of other disciples along with him, disciples of Christ. He says, and I hope toward God, I have hope toward God, rather, which hope these men themselves also entertain, that is, the ones that were with him. And here's the hope, that there is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. So what did Paul think? There's going to be a resurrection one day. The ones who have died are going to come back. I mean, this is a recurring theme in the Bible, and I encourage you to examine it for yourself. And lastly, on this particular subject, in John chapter 5, you know, we can never go to more important words than the things that Jesus says in here. And so we're looking at some of the words of Christ himself here. In, in John chapter 5, 28, he says, do not marvel at this, because the hour is coming in which all those in the memorial tomb will hear his voice and come out. So here's what Jesus had to say about a resurrection. One would, in time, at some point in the time, an hour would come, a period of time where there would be a resurrection. So what a good thought that is for us as well. So these are real words of comfort directly from the Bible. You know, this is better than what you can any man or, or even any religion. You know, these are what these are the thoughts the Bible has. You know, today we come together at a, you know, a, a tremendously sad occasion for our family. And many of you are close friends and are touched as well. I, we've talked, we've, we've cried, we've done different things. And we've talked about Philip, his good qualities, and laughed about him and so forth. All these are good, good things. But when we come together here like this to a sad occasion, a memorial of his death, uh, we do want to remember him finally, but there's really nothing we can do for him at this time. So what is the point of having you know, memorials, funeral services, whatever? Well, one thing, certainly it's a custom, isn't it? You, you just can't hardly get by without doing it because it's customary. But there is a point to it. We can have an opportunity to comfort the bereaved and assure one another that this loss is mutual. And now why it's not going to fix the problem here, it does win hearts just a little. So that's, that's a good angle for it. But there's another uh, point, too, that I found very interesting. And this, again, is in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 7 and verse 2. And uh, you know, to me, this is something that's very profound because it's talking about exactly what we're doing right now. It talks about coming to a house of mourning and, and what the purpose of it is from a scriptural point of view. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 2 says, Better is it to go to the house of mourning than to the banquet house. It's saying it's better to come together like this than it is to go off somewhere and have fun. Now why? There's nothing wrong with having fun, by the way, but in, in this particular case, it's better for us to be here at this time. It goes on to say, because that's the end of all mankind. And here's the point. The one alive should take it to his heart. You know, Philip was 52 years old. There's a lot of us in here, 52 and more. So, don't you think about your own mortality at a time like this? You know, what may happen to us tomorrow, next week, down the road? What will be the end of us? We don't know. But, you know, it could come suddenly. We could have a privilege to live a long time. But in any case, one of the things we want to do is to look at ourselves honestly. If we need to make adjustments to be more of a righteous person, this is something that we can decide on really here and now that we think about this situation. 
There's one other scripture. This is uh, actually the scripture just before the verse, just before I just read it in Ecclesiastes 7 and 1. And if you've never read this verse, to me, it's one of the most peculiar in the Bible. But when we analyze it, we understand it. Rome, uh, Ecclesiastes 7 and 1 says, A name is better than good oil. And here's the point. The day of death is the day of one being born. How could the Bible say that? Why would it say that it's a day of death is better than when you're born? Well, here the key is the first line. It says, a name is better than good oil. So a person that's made a good name with God, when they die, they're safe. I, I heard someone use an illustration one time. It's like a little baby being in his father's arms. He's safe. So when a person's made that good name, they are in God's memory. And there's nothing else that can happen to them. However, when a child is born, and think about today. You know, the times we live in are getting wickeder and wickeder. The choices for good are getting fewer and fewer, it appears, and the choices for bad are greater and greater. So the odds of a young one being born today and being ending up making a good name with God, being righteous, it seems they're getting slimmer and slimmer. So you can see the point there. Uh, if we die with a good name with God, it could be nothing more valuable than that. In Matthew 6, 19 to 21, I'm not, I'm not going to read that, but there, Jesus encouraged us to store up treasures in heaven. Now, of course, this would not be liberal things. It would be along the lines of making a good name with God. That would be much more valuable than any treasure we could ever accumulate here on earth. So that's what we want to do. Hopefully, uh, that's a thought we'll take away from here. You know, this has been a very sad and, and trying time for Philip's family and friends. And, you know, we've had some significant difficulty coping with it, there's no doubt. It went on for a long time, and, and, and he suffered. And so it was hard on the family, on his wife. Uh, we, we, we had some difficult times. But what we can see from this discussion here is that God's Word gives us real solid comfort and hope for the future. The possibility of us being able to see our dead loved ones again. I look forward to seeing Philip again. My mom, my grandparents, aunts and uncles that we've lost, ones that have been close to me. What a, what a nice thought that is, that the possibility for that is there. So it's been a comfort for us, too, uh, to see the many ones that supported this this morning and, and of course, last night. And then, uh, I was I was overwhelmed by the number of friends that uh, kept visiting Philip in the hospital, and oftentimes when he wasn't responsive. So anybody, I, I just want to give the families thanks to you for your concern and for all that you've done for Philip. Uh, many of you have been good friends to him for a long time. That was a valuable thing, and, and he appreciated it, and the family appreciates it. So we can take real comfort in what we've talked about here this morning because it is firmly grounded in God's Word and it's certain to be reliable. I'd like to conclude with prayer now, if you'll allow me. Our great Creator and Heavenly Father Jehovah, we thank you for this opportunity we have, uh, this day of life we've enjoyed. Uh, we know also, though, that many trials and tribulations that affect us all through our life. And, and certainly when we lose someone close to us, uh, what a profound uh, hurt that is. And it, it takes time to heal. So please be with us here. Help us to keep our minds and hearts directed in the right direction. Help us to remember Philip fondly. Uh, help us to get through the grieving process and, and eventually feel better, begin, begin to heal. We know uh, many have been affected by this, and it's something that uh, we will get through, but we need your help. So we ask forgiveness of all our sins and shortcomings. Uh, Again, we thank you for the many good blessings that we received. Just life itself, what a blessing. And we, we look forward to the day that we can welcome our dead loved ones back to life. So please be with us, Jehovah. We ask forgiveness of our sins. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes this memorial service for Philip Little. Uh, I just wanted to make a, one announcement, and that is that the family and friends will receive any, anyone who wants to come by at my home, and that's at 2248 Timbersville Highway. That's the corner of Hoffmeyer Road and Route 40. If you'd like to come by, we would be glad to have you. So thank you very much for attending, and again, thank you for all the support you've given to the family and the adults. We'll turn it back over to the funeral director now.
Thank you too, Jack. I'll be in there. Tell Steve I'll be in there. 